Kenneth Arrow stayed and he was a Nobel Prize winner as well. And so every day we would have breakfast together and a cab would pick us up after breakfast and take us to the university where we were involved in that symposium. And mostly, since I was kind of in awe of him, I would just listen to, to what he had to say. And he was pretty much like Joseph Stigler, Stiglitz and, uh, and uh, Paul Grootman. He was a little bit uh, disillusioned with uh, the standard uh, economic theory. A lot of those people reached the top. Because you see, not only do you have all this training to perpetuate the status quo, but we all want to succeed. This criterion, the hurdles that we jump over to succeed are all built that way. If you want to succeed, you better succeed in those terms. Stiglitz, before he got the Nobel Prize, was jumping over the ordinary neoclassical hurdles, like everyone else, and really jumping over them effectively, doing really, uh, really effective work jumping over neoclassical hurdles. But once he got it, he could, with uh, sort of impunity, say, well, I'm a little disillusioned with this faith now, <laughs> so forth. So it's a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely comfortable talking to you, telling you that this is, that you're being trained as priests to go out and defend the free market system and market efficiency and all that, because I don't want you to just go out and start throwing bombs or anything, because like me, when I finally got my PhD in economics, you probably need to earn a living, and I needed to earn a living. So you've got to get by as best you can. So my advice to you is get by as best you can, but study the history of economic thought. See where these ideas came to. The notion that everything is exchange, which has become so rooted in economics now, Go back and read that chapter that I have on uh, on Mill and uh, see, unfortunately for me, every once in a while my mind blanks out on a name, which is why it's just as well I'm not teaching anymore probably. <laughs> Mill and Frederick Bastiat. Bastiat, so far as I can ascertain, so far as I could see looking at the history of thought, is the first person to assiduously argue that everything in a capitalist market system that can, should be viewed as an exchange. Exchange is the generic, look at it and look at what he said and look at his values and look at where, and you see, you see the value of looking at these early statements is they didn't need to hide things nearly as well as people who, who, who write it now. They, they hide it under a, puffery of uh, abstraction. Um, two books that I read in the 1960s that uh, sort of cemented my view about hiding the real content behind abstraction. One was this book by a philosopher named William Barrett. This is not the first book I read. I loaned it and it didn't get returned, so I bought this one because uh, later, but this is a philosopher, oh, academic philosopher named William Barrett, and this book is The Illusion of Technique, and he shows that uh, uh, something happened in 20th century philosophy. There's a movement away from the deep philosophical concerns historically of philosophy, and a movement toward technique and abstraction. Uh, logical development of abstraction at a high, high level. That was noted long before Barrett in, in, uh, in literature by Hermann Hesse, the German writer, when he wrote, uh, and it was one of our former professors here at the University of Utah, Lawrence Neighbors, who made us all aware of this when he taught us years ago. Uh, he made us aware of uh, Hermann Hesse's book, The Glass Bead Game, and all of us read that. And The Glass Bead Game is about a society in which the most admired of all abilities 
is the capacity to reason abstractly at higher and higher and more complex levels. And uh, little children start developing the art of highly complex reasoning and highly abstract reasoning. And they get into competitions at higher and higher and more and more abstract levels of reasoning. And they have yearly competitions. And the person who is who reaches the highest level and is the best abstract reasoner in the entire society receives the title of Magister Ludi, the best reasoner in society. And the hero in the book, The Glass Beat Game, reaches that title, starts as a little boy. He shows a lot of alacrity and ability, and he really goes to higher and higher levels. And he reaches that title of Magister Ludi because uh, he can reason so well at high levels of abstraction. And then he goes through a period of disillusionment because he realizes he doesn't know a thing about life. He doesn't know anything that has any significance to him. And so, it, interestingly enough, it seems to me from where I started back when I was 18, if I had stayed with the abstract reasoning development, I might just as well have stayed with the people who take everything on authority. Because you take that on authority, or you take abstract reasoning on authority, but you never really have any confidence that on your own, you discovered anything about life, and about people, and about society, and about yourself, and where you fit in, and what's important in society, and so forth. And uh, it's lots of difficult things involved with that. I'm going through a thing right now. Uh, I hope I don't put my foot in my mouth with what I'm about to say, because, well, the reason I say this is because I don't know if any of you know my son and my grandchildren, someone like, and, and it's a delicate thing because my son and daughter-in-law are, are very good LDS people and I've become, in terms of supernatural beliefs, uh, a skeptic of everything. You know, I can't, I haven't arrived at any supernatural beliefs. I've become skeptical of almost all supernatural beliefs. But I have this grandson that I love so dearly. He's just so precious to me. And he's at the age where he's going to be called on his mission. And I'm just crossing my fingers that he says, I've got to think about things and figure out what I think first. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly where I was at his age. That's exactly where I, I was. That's exactly what I said to my bishop. I've got to figure out where I stand and what I think first. And here I am now. Uh, more than three quarters of a century later, and I still haven't figured it out. If my bishop was still alive, I'd, uh, if my bishop were still alive, I'd say, I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm working hard. <laughs> so and, anyway, uh, that's, that's the reason I think, if you think, well, that's just one opinion, my, I think uh, arriving that opinion, whether it's a good one or not, there's nothing like the history of economic thought to vindicate that, to convince you that I think what I, what I said I think is true and I think the best way to get at it is the history of thought. I think Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill got fuzzy because they were too liberal and too broad-minded, which is an asset. I love them both on that account when I read them. They're very attractive people. But most of the rest of the people were attracted to premises because somehow they felt inherently where that leads. And the premises lead. And the premises of everything is exchange and all we do is work out the abstraction of an exchange society where everything is exchange leads automatically to the beatific vision and eternal felicity. And this is the best of all possible worlds. So, 
Anyway, I'll, now I'll leave it to that and let you ask any questions. Okay, I have a question about Marx. How do you read his criticism of utopian socialists? I mean, he's, he, he says that they're not intellectually rigorous and that uh, what he wants to do is, uh, is something completely different than what they do. Uh, is he right? I mean, did, did he do something completely different from the utopian socialist, or was he fooling himself? Well, he did something very different, but he also was excessively harsh in his criticism, in my opinion. Unfairly harsh. That's my opinion. He was unfairly harsh. In fact, as you read Marx, this is my opinion from years of reading what he wrote, he was unfairly harsh. This is a kind of a personal criticism of him, what he must have been like as a, a personal as a personality. He was pretty unfairly crit uh, critical of anyone who differed very far from him. <laughs> he, he, got pretty, he got pretty polemical with anyone who differed very far from him. And that is, I think, a very unfortunate characteristic. And one of the most unfortunate things about that is that you alienate the reader by that. People who read Marx and hear him when he gets into one of those really polemical things, rightly are alienated. I'm alienated when I read them. Because I've read those, uh, many of those utopian socialists. Um, I've read John Stuart Mill, and I'm very attracted to him. I, I mean, he was a real humanitarian. And we have to remember that Marx, because he participated in the 1848 revolution in Germany, he had a death sentence if he returned to Germany. He would have been executed. And uh, then he went up first to Belgium and then to France and then around. And no government wanted him. And uh, it was John Stuart Mill that persuaded the English government to allow him to live out his life in England. Even though the English government did put a caveat on it uh, that Mill objected to, the English government put the caveat that he not write anything in English, <laughs> which he agreed to. <laughs> so, but that was Mill, and uh, Mill, and and Marx still was, I think, quite unfair in his criticism of Mill, even though he softened it a little bit where Mill was concerned. But as I read those utopian socialists, and if you think of the state of understanding of society when they were writing. I can't help but greatly admire and feel a, a kinship with them and uh, feel that Marx was quite unfair in his... The thing that where he stands out above them, and he doesn't need to be polemical with them to stand out here, is that they didn't have nearly as sophisticated an understanding of what capitalism is as he did. Other points? Any other? Well, I'll, I'll say something here. Um, now, I agree with you that uh, making uh, the description of economics or the, of, of the economy more abstract uh, brings in uh, the illusion that you understand how it works. But at the same time, the abstraction of economics and thinking in terms of economic models um, has been used to uh, produce policy. So uh, how would you think uh, we can bypass, I don't know if you refer to abstraction as the mathematical abstraction, uh, or in mathematical terms, how can we still um, use economics not only for, you know, being philosophers, uh, uh, but also for practicing economics in See, policy making? I, I didn't want to give the impression, probably I gave a misimpression, that I'm opposed to abstraction per se. It's rather 
it has to have some theory and it has to be tied down to some theory. And what I'm saying is that most of the principal abstractions that you find in most of the theoretical journals in economics doesn't tie down and doesn't do anything to rectify the weaknesses of microeconomic theory as it's done in the intermediate textbooks and as it supports theoretical welfare economics right now. And so the main theory that supports most of the practical policies in the world uh, is, is out there and it appears as though highly abstract stuff is supporting it and I'm arguing that it doesn't. It's not that I think abstraction per se uh, is bad. I mean the main power that human beings have over our closest relatives, chimps and bonobos, is a greater power we have to think abstractly. I do think that and I think so I, I've created a misimpression if I think that this is against abstraction, but abstraction can also be a kind of uh, a, a, a kind of uh, effort to create a smoke screen and, a, and hide what's going on. Oh, yeah. And that and that that's what I'm talking about. And I think I think in the main. <coughs> I think in the main, that's, that's what happened. But what happened when I was up at Willamette with our former student, uh, Jerry Gray, uh, I gave a talk there and some of the students there were saying, well, why is it that utility theory has so much rigorous analytical theory supporting it and the labor theory has no analytical theory supporting it? And uh, so that really is a question of what you've been taught. So you've been taught some utility theory doesn't have very much. Utility theory doesn't go very far. It rests on such unusual assumptions that nobody wants to push it very far. There's not much, there's not much theory that anyone wants to push it very far. On the other hand, post rafa versions of labor theory can get pretty abstract and pretty uh, and yet they tie into a real theory if they if they can tie and and some of those some of those theories are quite abstract but they do tie down to a theory so the abstraction there's nothing wrong with it per se if it anchors into a real theory where people can understand what the theoretical precept is and understand where it goes what i'm saying is look at look at the whole Thing right now, where is the policy? Uh, look, look at what's happened in economics right now at the profession. The whole time I was a student and teaching economics, ordinary textbooks, principles, and intermediate had two sections: macro and micro. The macro uh, section was Keynes, and now if you do Keynes, you become like Krugman, and he says, "Oh, he's a left-wing fanatic." That's what everyone's saying, because Keynes, Keynes is virtually forgotten now. Everything, Keynes for decades and decades said, if there's a recession, then automatically tax receipts are going to go down and you're going to have deficit spending. Now, only the very left wing of the Democratic Party is saying that. <laughs> Center and, and conservative wing of the uh, Democratic Party is going with the Republicans saying, slash Social Security, slash Medicare, slash all the entitlements. My God, see, the economists have not done anything, I don't think. They're the so-called policy economists are a bunch of wusses. So far as I can tell, they lend, the, they lend themselves to defense of the status quo. But when it comes to th something like that, I see people like Krugman defending ordinary Keynesian policy, and he's pretty good that way. But in the main, the economics profession hasn't done much to back them up, it doesn't seem to me. Yeah, well, uh, I personally, I don't, I mean, I, 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 I understand what you say today and how important that we have to study this history of economic thought. I mean, I agree with 
most of what you say. But, uh, well, for my feeling, uh, I just felt so many times, you know, when I try to study this sort of thing, that maybe we don't have to study history of economic thought for anything. You know, like, for example, when I read novels, I don't mean to use my knowledge on novels to do anything. Just have fun. Read what you're reading now, I don't understand that. Do you only read what? If you read a novel. Novels. Oh, oh. Yeah, it for yeah, it's just oh. written for fun, you know, just yeah. for okay. thing. I mean, so many times uh, I just feel that maybe if we have to, well, people question about why do we have to get back to study this thing, right, the history of idea. I just answer myself, I mean, I answer to myself for that question that I read, you know, I study because I just want to know. And that's it. For me, I mean, I but still, I don't, I don't disagree with you for like the reason of go back to the yes. this thing. I just that yeah. my speaking. Well, and there's another reason that I would say, and that is, most some of you probably don't appreciate what an unusual opportunity you have to be at the University of Utah, and how different it is having been around quite a few departments myself, in my teaching experience, both in the ones where I was employed as a teacher and then I had a few visiting jobs too as a visiting professor in a few departments. And uh, this department gives you a lot more possibilities and a lot more of a liberal atmosphere to pursue different points of view in different directions than most places. Most places uh, <coughs> You wouldn't have a person saying what I said, come and saying what I just said to you today. Most departments you wouldn't. Most departments would never have my book as a as a textbook in their department. Uh, it uh, it uh, most economics departments are quite conservative, very conservative, and one of the reasons if 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 that kind of conservatism doesn't suit you. If it does suit you and you find it good, oh, look, in fact, before I finish that sentence, I have to tell you, I got an email about two years ago, three years ago, from a guy who is a full professor at the University of Chicago, very right-wing professor. He says, you undoubtedly don't remember me. From 1969, I took your class at the University of California, Riverside, where we had this class, Topics in the History of Economic Thought, and you could do anything you wanted, and I had this class that I did. Uh, Veblen, Thorstein Veblen and John Bates Clark, and we would read the two of them, <laughs> Veblen and Clark, and that's all we would do for a whole course, read the two of them. And he said, I loved that course. He said, that was one of my favorite courses. He said, unfortunately for you, Professor Hunt, I loved Clark. <laughs> and he said, now I'm a full professor at the University of Chicago. And I emailed him back. He said, well, that just shows you how fair-minded I was. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the, point, the point of that is uh, uh, you're going to get in situations where uh, if, if, you like, if you like John Bates Clark, if you're like him, you're going to be fine in any department, no matter where you go. But if you like Veblen the best, if you like some, you're going to be better off if you study that uh, history of thought and get so you can somewhat defend yourself. Because you're going to come under attack if when you get into conservative departments. And sad to say, it's one way in which the profession is worse than it was when I started out, the job market's worse. So many of you are just going to have to take whatever job you get. And if it's a very right-wing department, you're just going to have to keep quiet a lot of the time. And when you don't keep quiet, <laughs> defend, learn to defend yourself. And there's no better way to defend yourself than become conversant in a lot of these things. In my opinion. Yes. Uh, when you said that uh, uh, <coughs> abstraction is used to hide what is uh, uh, what is really going on. Uh, what did you exactly mean by that? For example, 
uh, I mean, who's doing it and for what purpose? I mean, to be more uh, precise. Okay, I, I can tell you what's going on is that students are being taught that the market is efficient and that you move into those quadrants and automatically go out to the uh, production possibilities curve through automatic uh, profit maximizing behavior and uh, consumer maximizing behavior. You automatically go out to that, and that's automatic behavior and so forth. Well, you see, people at a high level of economic uh, sophistication don't believe that for a minute. That's bullshit. That's where what's being hidden. So they don't believe it. That's propaganda. That's, that's what it is. Right. So who's putting out this propaganda? Was my you are if you teach it to me. We all are. Then, then my question is, am I, uh, uh, am I doing it on my own? Or am I doing it because I, it benefits me somehow and there are people out there who sort of forced me to do it? Nobody forced you. This is the way this is the way all conservative ideologies do their job. Yeah. See, uh, you're doing it because, first of all, there's very few jobs as good as being a college professor. I said that in the beginning. I am so happy that I could have made my living my whole life doing that. I look around. I have two sons. One's a college professor and one's an attorney. My son, who's an attorney, always says, oh, God, I wish I'd followed your other son. <laughs> he so regrets he became an attorney. So it's a great job. That now, I just told you my friend Jerry Gray, who's a professor who went through this department, he's really good, too. He would like to alter their curriculum so they don't have to do so much what he views. He, he sees the same as I do. He agrees with me on this. He won't have to do so much of this propaganda. I tell him, the problem is it's institutional. It's not one person's evil doing. It's institutional. So suppose he says, well, you don't have to take intermediate macroeconomics. You take this class in Marxian economics, and you take this class reading Veblen, and you take this class. The problem with that is, in lots of these graduate schools, they're going to say, we're not going to take these students from Willamette. They didn't learn any macroeconomic theory. See, there's an institutional barrier. It's not, it's not the will of an individual that does it. It's a built-in. If it was the will of an individual, it would not be an effective ideology. That's the way ideologies operate. Uh, when you say it's uh, the problem, 